But I need our viewing and listening audience to say a prayer this morning because we have an evil demon that lives inside computers that needs to be exercised, that needs to be kicked out, that needs to be abolished. Uh, I have had tech issues left and right, so I need your prayers. Uh, just, just say, do some spiritual warfare right now. Say, uh, a demon of technological infringement, we cast you out in the name of Jesus. I'm going to spell it together, okay? Just for a minute, we're not going to be Lutheran, we're going to be charismatic, uh, and it's, it's Outside of that, I'm fine. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the Call to Be podcast, where we seek to empower everyday believers to discover and live out their authentic calling in Christ to be a greater blessing in our world today. I'm Reverend Dr. Travis Guzzi. I'm the Executive Director of Wellness and Coaching for the Southeastern District, as well as an ICF-certified life and executive coach and a Gallup Strengths Coach. And we want to welcome all of you today, our listening and viewing audience, for our once a month Called to Be podcast. And it is wonderful to be here with all of you. And in studio, we have Trish Freshwater and online from his uh, secret bunker location, uh, the RevKev, Kevin Scott. Uh, great to be with both of you today. How are you both doing? Doing well. It is fall. Uh, the leaves are getting ready to change and looking forward to all of the wonderful, magnificent things that that time of year brings. Yeah, we're actually going out to do some apple picking out in Charlottesville oh, tomorrow. Jealous. Yeah, except it's going to be like 79 degrees. That's not really oh. fall apple weather, but you know what? We're going to make the best of it. And, and how are the colors up there in Maryland? Um, the colors are fine, but I need our viewing and listening audience to say a prayer this morning because we have an evil demon that lives inside computers that needs to be exercised, that needs to be kicked out, that needs to be abolished. Uh, I have had <laughs> tech issues left and right. Uh, I've gone through my third computer this week. Third computer. It's crazy. Um, now I'm not even using a computer. I'm using a, a cell phone to podcast with all of you. So I need your prayers. Uh, just just say, do some spiritual warfare right now. <laughs> say, a, a demon of technological infringement, we cast you out in the name of Jesus. I'm going to spell it together. Okay, just for a minute. We're not going to be Lutheran. We're going to be charismatic. Uh, and it's... It, uh, outside of that, I'm fine. Hey, Kevin, uh, there is a common denominator there. Are we sure it's the computers? <laughs> yeah, it's the computer. It, it absolutely is. Um, and if you're if you're insinuating that in any way this is a user error, um, <laughs> you you could be right. But the the problem is is that I'm the newest variable, and these computers have been around this place for a long time. So I'm I'm pretty sure I'm not the one that got them to <laughs> they are now. Um, although I am an imperfect sinner and in need of God's grace, so it's always possible. So uh, I, I'm assuming you're going to be laying some holy hands upon these uh, computers here soon? We're gonna lay, yes, we're going to be laying holy hands. We are going to uh, whip out the holy oil. We will be offering up incense. We're going to do all denominations, Travis. We're going to be Roman Catholic. We're going to swing the, the incense back and forth. We're going to do the Latin mass, but we're going to be charismatic too. Okay. We're going to do some, uh, we're, we're, what do charismatics do with what we're going to get animated with it. We're going to lay on the hands. We're going to do everything that we can. And we're going to expel, mm. uh, this evil virus demon. I, from I was the thinking computer. the Holy, uh, sledgehammer might be in order. <laughs> yeah. That, that has been, uh, that's been talked about. That has been talked about. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. Um, it's, it's scary. very, very scary, but, um, we're here and we're not going to let it hold this podcast back because, uh, we're going to talk about something today. What are we going to talk about? I don't even know. Trish, what are we talking about today? Why don't we just set up the, uh, the, the conversation and uh, get this, uh, this podcast back on track? Sure. So we are today starting a four-part series called Unlocking Your Kingdom Potential. And so here we're going to explore the importance of developing our character. And so our character is something that we all talk about. Uh, we talk about it very casually day to day. You talk about people. You talk about, oh, well, you know, they've got good character or bad character. And yeah, this is not being a character. Yes. No, no. Like <laughs> Kevin's can be a good character. <laughs> but we're talking about people's internal character. Um, <laughs> we love no, you, Kevin. <laughs> no, 
This is actually really cool because uh, at uh, St. Paul's, we've been doing a sermon series on the life of Jacob for the last three weeks. And that's a really, really cool sort of character study in someone who starts out with very little character, but through he was a character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And he was surrounded by characters. Yeah. But uh, this week, we're on to the, ep- the famous episode where he wrestles with God. And it's finally here that he actually um, gets some character, but only through struggle. And so I don't know if that has anything to do with what we're going to talk about today. But I do think that character is something that uh, is formed in the trenches in us for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this series, uh, unlock, Unlocking Your Divine Potential, um, we really want to see the kingdom potential of people. And so we started last podcast looking at this of unpacking um, your divine GPS and starting with the gift of your personality. And as we talked about, personality is really kind of made of two components. There's our personality as far as our temperament. Um, that's the hardwiring of God's design. Today, we're taking a look at character, which I would kind of see as software. It's something that is it vital, it's important, but it can be programmable. So it's the part of our personality that actually can grow and be developed. And the importance of having good character and the implications when you don't. So that's kind of what we're looking at today. Let's start off with um, asking you both a question. How would you define character? And why is it so important? Well, I think that whenever I hear the word character, not being a character, but character, you know, I think about the the classic comic strip where there's a little kid who's got a chore that he's supposed to do and he doesn't want to do it. So dad wants him to go mow the lawn or dad wants him to go rake the leaves or something like that. And the kid says, why do I have to do this, dad? I don't want to do it. And his dad's response is, it builds character. Okay, that, that's kind of what I think of. And so if you think about it in terms of God as our heavenly father, you know, I think sometimes he sends us uh, struggles and he sends us perhaps um, situations that we'd rather not be in because in the moment they're hard. But on the other side of it, it's as St. Paul says, we persevere and perseverance builds character. Right, exactly, exactly. And I agree. And, and part of that too is that character is that essence of who you are. It is that internal thing that drives you forward. It is the one thing that becomes part of everything you do. Um, it's like a guidepost. Um, so if you have good character, good moral character, we can pull in the whole Boy Scout um, thing as well. You know, it's, it, it helps guide you in all of your actions and yeah. everything that you're doing in your life. So associated with it was, is values, actions. I actually heard a great definition of character. It's, it's who you are when people aren't watching. Yes. You know, which also shows us that, you know, character isn't just what we do outwardly that for people to see, but it's really essence and guides us in our decisions in life. Um, there's something we're going to put on the screen for our viewing audience. Um, there's a little tool when I talk about the importance of character. Uh, and it's this idea of the, the character competency matrix. And so for our listening audience, if you imagine a line going up and down vertically, um, that measures whether on the top that's high character or low character. And then horizontally uh, to the left would be low competency and high competency. And I think especially when we consider um, our vocations of work, um, we're, we're always looking for people who have high competencies and capacity, uh, skills and, and knowledge to be able to do jobs. But I think character is just as important. And this isn't just in the workplace. I think this is with families and, and as followers of Christ. So when you take a look at the different matrix on this, let me, let me lay it out for everybody. And those who are viewing, you can see this on your screen and then get your reaction. So if you have low competency and low character, basically you're irrelevant. It's like, okay, you don't know anything, you can't do anything, and we can't trust you. So basically, uh, we can't rely on you for anything. If you have somebody who has low competency but high character, they're limited in the good that they can do. So this is a person who has potential. We want to keep an eye on them, uh, but we have to build up their competency. And actually, if I were to choose between those those two, I, I would take the person with high character and low competency because we can build competency. Character's harder. Now, if you had somebody with low character 
but high competency, that's somebody who's dangerous. That's somebody who knows a lot, can get a lot done, but boy, you, you wouldn't want to trust him with things of responsibility. And then the highest, um, which is the high character and high competency, that's somebody who's fruitful. That's somebody you can trust, that you know they can get the job done, and what they do is going to have an impact around them. What, what's your reaction to that? And where do you see this uh, kind of idea yeah. being helpful? Well, well, it makes it makes all the sense in the world, Travis, because, um, you know, when I think about a so let's uh, when I think about again, let's talk about characters, not char- well, character and characters for a second. <laughs> but when I think about just famous people who might fit into each of those categories that you outlined, you know, a person that I would say would have very, very high competency, but very low character would be somebody like Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol. You know, we're, we're almost right up on Christmas, and this is someone who's a fantastic businessman, yeah. right? He's a great businessman. He does what's right for the business, but he has no character because he treats people like garbage. And that's what the whole story is really about, is about how um, really he goes through this transformation of developing characters so that he can be that person who has both high competency and high character. You know, I think I think that you've got to have both. But I'm with you. If I've got to pick the person, um, if I've got to pick between character and competency, uh, I'm going to pick character every time because you're right. You can you can build competency. You can teach somebody how to learn a job, and they can get better at it. But to take somebody who has low character or no character and try to instill those values in them, that that's a lot harder. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's something we actually talk about in HR, um, in the companies where I've worked. We look for candidates uh, in the hiring process who maybe are going to be a really good fit with the department and they have good transferable skills, things that can work well in many different positions, but they may not have all of the technical qualities for that role. And that's okay because you can always teach them the technical qualities, the competency but if they don't fit from a character perspective, they're not going to be a good fit overall. Yeah, and and yeah. so we look at that all the time in HR. Yeah. And, and we see, I think, one of our problems of leadership in our world today, whether it's in the business world or in the church, is we have people who have some high competency, really gifted individual. The problem is their character isn't there. They don't fit. Yeah. And, and I even sometimes see character as kind of like whipped cream. Um, when you have high competency and low character, it tastes good. But boy, in tough times, it goes splat and it's not there. It has no substance to it, um, which is part of, I think we're seeing so much moral failure in the church, whether it's the Catholic church, the non-denom world, and, and fortunately even our church tradition from time to time. Travis, I, I couldn't agree more. And that was, I, I, that was actually that it was weird that you said that because that popped into my head um, right as you were saying it. You know, I, I'm not going to call anybody out, but um, a while ago, there was a particular preacher, uh, uh, pastor, f- pretty famous, actually, um, pastor of a, of a huge church, had a, I mean, fan- and actually a very gifted teacher and preacher, I would say, very, very gifted. Um, and he, he really excelled in that. But the problem is, is that, and I think even he, he it, again, it's the case that you see far too many times, you know, affairs come out and there's this huge fall from grace. And I think even now, you know, learning from this, I think he would say, yeah, the problem is, is that back then um, I, I had no character. I was I was promoted into this too quickly because of my gifts. And I thought I was invincible. I thought I was untouchable. And I didn't have the characters to support this to make good decisions. OK, so, yeah, you're right. I mean, even in the church, you know, we're, we're not invincible to this at all. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it's a it's a failure of leadership. And, and I think when we see the failure of leadership in our world today, it's not as much competency. I think it's a character issue, whether it's in government and politics um, and, and, and the really the leadership vacuum we have in our nation, uh, in corporations and the church today. So let me ask you both, um, what kind of character should we develop? When we think about developing people of character, what should we be looking for? I think it comes down to people who have common values, common desires, uh, and and things that will help build the community that we live in. Uh, so really having the opportunity to build people who are going to have those same values becomes important. Yeah, so, so kind of a cultural and corporate values that mm-hmm. we share in common together of saying, this is how we act. This is how we behave. This is what we're about and what's important to us. Right. Kevin, how would you answer that? 
Yeah, and I, I think with me, it's it's a little bit closer to home because my my kids are all very very young, and right now, probably the the most character development that I'm doing is with my son. He's five, mm. and for him, um, I think the the most important thing that I'm trying to or things that I'm trying to instill in him are kindness and empathy. Mm. And he is he is a competitive competitive kid. This kid has got a competitive streak like you've never seen. And he does not like to lose. And right now, you know, the challenge there is I'm trying to teach him, number one, how to be a good loser, you know, and that's called sportsmanship. Yeah. But also, you know, when you're on the soccer field or the basketball court or when you're in the wrestling match or football field or whatever it is that you do, you know, winning is really, really important, but it is not the most important thing. You know, if you're on the soccer field and someone falls and breaks a leg, you don't you don't kick the ball because it's an easy goal. You stop what you're doing. Yeah. Because then now winning is not the objective. Now it's kindness and empathy. And I'm trying to teach him that. It's a it's a little bit of a challenge, but I think once you have that, a lot of character traits flow out of that. Once you've got kindness and empathy down. Yeah, I almost kind of see like these natural drives, which can be good within us, but it, they're like big powerful horses and they want to run. The, the, oh, yeah. the thing is character knows how to pull them back, when to go, how to direct them. Mm -hmm. And so it's really kind of our interaction of taking the best of who we are, but make sure that we live that out in good and responsible ways in relationships to others. And it's yeah. not the way you use the term when we talk about our gifts and passions and strengths, but it's that internal GPS. It's, yeah. it's, it's that guiding force of leading us in the right direction. That's right. Well, you know, there, there was some thought about character over the, the centuries. Um, Aristotle was known, and actually in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, a lot of uh, uh, scholars and educators uh, kind of really highlighted. Um, he had what was called the cardinal virtues. And for him, he thought that the ones that were most important were courage, justice, um, prudence, and temperance. Those four, courage, justice, prudence, and temperance. And his vision for life was what he called the heroic life. Um, that's really what human flourishing and thriving and happy, happiness was all about, was being that hero, uh, kind of that Greek city-state kind of thing. We think of maybe the movie 300 and the, the story of the, uh, um, the against the Persians, the Greeks against the Persians. Um, so that was kind of his uh, view. But then over the centuries, um, especially with uh, Scripture, uh, with uh, the, the Christian faith, we also have what was known as the theological virtues or the kingdom virtues, uh, things like what we get from uh, 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love, or the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Um, so when we think about the types of people that we want to grow, it's, it's not that the Aristotle's uh, heroic life uh, character and virtues are bad. Um, I think they're good for being good citizens, but we're also being called to develop uh, this this Christ likeness and these higher virtues um, that that really reflect what being in the kingdom and what life in the kingdom is all about. It's a balance. Yeah, yeah. Kendall, Kendall, Kendall Kevin. Kendall. <laughs> Sorry, Kendall. Um, as you think <laughs> about you. developing these from a pastoral standpoint, um, the, the 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 kingdom uh, virtues of faith, hope, and yeah. love. Uh, the fruit of the yeah. spirit, um, kind of this Christ-like life, loving and serving others. How do you see your role as a pastor in, yeah. in that development? I get what you're saying, you know, because part of a, well, as I kind of wear two hats because I'm at a church that also happens to have a, a large, large, large school. And I knew going into that, that um, when it came to teaching the Christian faith in the school, uh, the eighth graders were mine. I, I wanted that group because they're they're a massive challenge, uh, but they also require, I think, a, a very specific kind of instruction. So uh, I'm kind of wearing two hats. You know, you've got your you've got your people, you've got your parishioners, but then I've also got my kids that I'm working with as well. And honestly, you know, every day it's a uh, I just pray to be more Christ like in how I do this because when I look at at Jesus, the thing about him is when I, when I think about his character and the type of character that he had, you know, this was a person who could be unbelievably compassionate and empathetic, but also in the same breath, brutally honest 
and demanding. And it seems to me that being Christ-like is knowing what to do in, in each given situation. You know, you have to know when to be compassionate and when, and then you have to know when to push. You have to know when to demand more. Um, I, I think I probably do more of this with my eighth graders than with my parishioners, but there's some of it there too. And I mean, right now, I'm, there's this dirty, nasty trick that I learned in seminary, but man, do you learn from it. Uh, it's called the, the write them till you pass essay, where you, the assignment is to write an essay and it's the grade is either pass or fail and you have to keep writing it until you pass. And I'm doing this with my eighth graders now, and most of them don't pass the first time because I think that, you know, if it's low hanging fruit and it comes easy, then the, the character isn't going to come with that. And the treasuring of the faith, you know, is, is not going to, to come with that. You know, what does, uh, what does the, the Bible say? Work out your faith with fear and trembling or something yes. like that. Yeah. And I think that's really what it is. It is in a sense, you know, if, if faith is a gift of God. But it's also something that we we work at our whole lives and we struggle with. And I think part of that, again, we come back to it again and again and again. It's the it's the struggle that builds character. Yeah, yeah. Trish, in, in the workplace, I'd be curious of how you see the development of character, if at all, in the workplace. I don't know that many organizations do individual development of character, but there is a focus on values for the organization. Most companies will have a set of values that are important to them. Uh, so maybe it's teamwork, maybe it's um, innovation, um, you know, and there's different types of values that are important that be, that transcend the entire workplace. And so then employees are then expected to live up to those values. Yeah. So it's the corporate values. And now how does this permeate the culture? And Correct. how do you fit individually within that corporate culture? And that's a good way to know if you're a good fit for the organization too. You know, for anyone on the job search hunt, um, when you go to the, their websites and looking at the values, most companies will in their about us or on their careers page will put out there, our values are X, Y, and Z. And that's their way of trying to vet candidates to see if you will be a productive employee in that workplace. Um, are you going to match what their expectations are for you? And that comes back to community as well. So, you know, as a community, we have expectations in the community how people will behave in a neighborhood, in a church, or in the larger community as a whole. Let's not talk about school board meetings. But, um, <laughs> you know, how people behave in different yeah. settings, there are expectations. And so it's the same thing in the workplace. Um, do you, does your character match yeah. those expectations? So I heard a really interesting, I don't know if you read this a couple of weeks ago, there was a CEO or a leader of an organization and part of the hiring process, he would always uh, give the individual some coffee with cream and then for him, it was always, what did they do with the cup afterwards? If they just mm -hmm. left the cup, Fascinating. he wouldn't hire him. But if they would walk it over to the sink and, and rinse it, that was somebody he wanted. And that was his judge of whether he hired you or not. I mean, didn't tell you going in, here's a cup of coffee. Let's talk about the company, what the job would be. The, 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 but, but it all came down to what did they do with the coffee cup after? So that's like putting the cart back in the grocery store parking lot. Yes. <laughs> My personal pet peeve, please put your carts yep. away. It takes 10 seconds. <laughs> right, right, right. So there's some yep, different yep, thought yep. about how characters developed. I mean, one is just the, the working at it. It's, it's habits, um, you know, and, and we know that um, for a habit to develop, it takes about two months um, or about 66 days on average for a person that if you keep doing something over and over and over, uh, a behavior will more and more grow into a habit in your life. So that's kind of one way. Um, but but there's some others. Uh, Luther talked about, uh, Kevin, maybe you could shed a little light, that yeah. what, what he always thought would make a great theologian was prayer, meditation, and trials. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember this. Um and it's a, it's a really, really, really cool idea. And I think it's right. Um, and it really, I, I think Luther didn't just teach this. I think he lived it. But basically the idea is that we, we grow closer to God through struggle. And we grow closer to God through suffering and trial. Because what happens is that something bad happens to us. There's some kind of attack that happens. There's a, there's a, there's a time in our life when we feel distant from God or we go through sickness or we lose a job or something happens. 
And ultimately what that does is it ends up driving us to our knees and it drives us to prayer and it drives us to rely more fully on God. Now, of course, when that happens, it ticks the devil off and it stirs him up. So he comes after us again with more spiritual attack. And so then again, that drives us again to our knees back to faith. And it's just this constant cycle that we're going through our entire lives. But the end result is that no matter how vicious or how bad the attack is, our faith is always better for it on the other side. Um, and it's a, it's kind of a weird, it's a weird idea. It's countercultural that God uh, is actually doing really good things for you through things that look really awful and really bad. Yeah, and that's where Luther in his teaching on vocation talked about the cross of our vocations. When we kind of basically experience struggles in our vocations, whether it's our own failures or circumstances that that just disappoint and don't live up to what we hope for, that it always drives us back to the cross. But it talks about that that part, importance of struggles. And we hear about this in Romans 5, starting in verse 3. More than that, we rejoice in our suffering. When was the last time you rejoiced in your suffering? Uh, that That's kind of that moment of whether God uh, flicks us uh, kind of in that baking process to see, see whether we'll thud or ring. Uh, more than that, we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so that you see that that process that Luther talked about. It's this idea of uh, suffering, endurance, character. It's part of God's yeah. shaping process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, I, I have to come back to this just because Jacob is fresh on my mind. But um, sort of the the catalyst for some of this uh, series was uh, was Tim Keller, God rest his soul. Um, I, I absolutely love that man. And he he had a wonderful, wonderful presentation that he gave called The Theology of the Cross and Walking with a Limb. And in it, he said, you know, the age old question is, why do bad things happen to good people? And if we look at the life of Jacob, the answer is because God is trying to bless you. And he ends his talk by saying the blessings of God always come with a limp. Because in this climactic episode in Jacob's life, he grabs a hold of God for all he's worth and says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And of course, God touches his hip. The hip shatters, but he still won't let him go. And then on the other side of this, there's blessing. So why is God picking a fight with me? He's picking a fight with you because he's trying to bless you. Yeah, yeah. And I think the hard thing too as adults is seeing the light on the other side of that tunnel. We get very... um, overwhelmed and stuck in looking at those trials. But when we see our children going through trials, our immediate thought is, oh, they're going to grow from this. It's going to be wonderful for them. It's really difficult. I hate to watch them go through this, but they're going to be better for it. But we have a very hard time turning that perspective yeah, on ourselves. Yeah, it's always, yeah, for others, it's easy to give that advice. But for ourselves, it's it's very difficult. I know for my my life, man, I, I had a ch- tough childhood. I mean, it was really challenging, very difficult. Don't have to go into it here. But, um, you know, I, I remember, though, people would ask me, well, would you want it to be different? And sure, I would love to have parents who bless me the way God intended and having a good, loving Christian home. And yet, though, I don't know if I would be the man of God I am today if it wasn't for those trials and what God led me through in in growing from those. They shape you. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. actually, when we apply this to business, um, you know, it's interesting, venture capitalists oftentimes do not want to invest in entrepreneurs unless they failed a few times. Um, they don't want somebody who hasn't experienced failure because they haven't learned any lessons yet. So kind of interesting how this applies to the business world. Uh, by the way, there's one more kind of idea of how character is formed. So it's establishing practices, it's trial and tribulations, which God uses to build and develop us. The last one, there's there's this idea of attachment theory. And basically that we grow into those things that we attach ourselves and really treasure and love in our life. Um, and so it's like being around people. And in some ways, it's kind of the idea of faith is more caught than taught. Um, you know, when you're around people and you want to be like them and, and whether that's individually or in community. And um, there's a great guy, um, Dallas Willard. He wrote a book called Rev- Revolution or no, 
revolution of the heart. It was a revolution of the heart. Um, but basically in there, he introduces this idea of Veeam, uh, the, the Veeam uh, model for spiritual transformation. And Veeam is an acronym that stands for vision, intention, and means. So for him, it's if you want to grow in Christ likeness, don't try harder, grow closer and closer to Jesus. And so we have the vision of who Jesus is. There are means by which we grow spiritually. Uh, the word, the sacraments, baptism, the Lord's Supper, uh, other spiritual disciplines like prayer that we can grow. But the key in that middle, the intention, it's are we intentionally making use of the means that God has given to grow in the vision of Christ likeness in our character and who we are in our faith. Um, so I kind of equate it to, you know, if you got a garden, you know, you can plant the seeds, but are you weeding? Are you intentionally dragging the hose over and watering? Are you making sure you're putting some fences up to protect your vegetables so the critters don't eat them? Um, so, so there's an intentionality that goes into it. Um, it. It's not we who cause the growth, God does, but we make intentional use of the means that God promises by which that growth comes. And that goes right back to how you open this up. Character can be built, it can be changed, it can morph in any direction if you pay attention to it. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I have to actually, again, I got to go back to my, my eighth graders. I have to build one of them up here because uh, I really um, wanted to reflect on something that you said right at the beginning of that, which is this idea that we we grow into that which we love or we start to reflect that which we love. And so if you want to be Christ-like, again, don't try harder, grow closer to Christ. And there was a one of my eighth graders wrote this amazing essay. I couldn't believe that this came from an eighth grader. It was so good. And it wasn't plagiarized. Like I could tell he wrote it. But um, he was talking about the movie Sa The Sandlot, if you've seen oh, that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and he was talking about how he sees Jesus in that movie. And where he sees it is in the character of Benny. Now, Benny is the best player on this team of ragamuffin kids who play baseball every day. He's the, they all know he's going to go on to the majors because he's so, so good. He's so talented. And then you've got this kid, Smalls, Scott Smalls, who is a, a loser, a geek. Nobody likes him, and he's a horrible baseball player. So Benny reaches out in friendship and befriends him. And the closer they grow in their friendship, the better of a baseball player Smalls starts mm. to become. And this kid, it was amazing. He said, this is how our, our walk with Jesus is. Yep. The closer we grow to Jesus, the more we start to look and act like him. And I was like, I can't believe an eighth grader wrote this. Like, you hit it right on the head. And yeah. that's, that's exactly what we're talking about, that we start to reflect and our, our character starts to become based on the, the things and the people that we love. And so if we want our character to reflect Christ, learn to love Christ. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Not too long ago, our son Kendall uh, did something and goes, yeah, I guess I'm my mother's son. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think about that, you know, hearing that comment, it's like, I would like that to be my relationship with God is I want to be my father's son. You know, I mm -hmm. want to grow in Christ likeness and, and what the kingdom virtues and character looks like um, so that I can be a good reflection of him to the world around us. So that when, when people say, hey, there's Travis, that's a child of God. It makes mm -hmm. me think right now of, of that whole nature nurture uh, yeah. conversation. You're not necessarily born with all of your character traits. But if you nurture them, you can become them. Yeah. And that leads us to the last part of our podcast is um, there's a great assessment tool for any of our viewing and listening audience that would like to maybe think about, hey, what is the character that I have and how can I grow and develop? And it's called VIA. Uh, VIA is an acronym, Values in Action. So it's the uh, VIA Character Strengths. And it's a, a great assessment tool that was developed out of the field of positive psychology uh, where some researchers basically studied every culture and religion in the world and created this classification of six kind of virtues or domains of character and then 24 uh, character strengths that they recognized. Um, and so you could take this, by the way, you could take it for free and get your results or you could dive in a little deeper with it. Uh, but like, here's mine. And I think you both took it so we can dialogue on this. Uh, my top five are spirituality, which is not a surprise by anybody who knows me. Uh, creativity, gratitude, love, and then the one I love, zest. I, I like some zest and adventure <laughs> in my life. Um, mm -hmm. But then here's my bottom. And, and see, the idea is what's your top and how can you harness it and develop it? 
But then it's also unlike maybe with Clifton Strengths, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks, um, because this isn't baked in, this isn't part of our biology and hardwiring, it can be developed, is what's your bottom and now how do you put attention to grow in those? It took this a number of years ago. I'd be interested. Maybe I should retake it now and, and see. But my bottom at the time were humility, need to grow in some humility, self-regulation. Um, when there's a carton of ice cream in the freezer, I have no self-control over that. <laughs> Me so. either. It's okay. Uh, we can form a, a support group. It's all good. Yep. Uh, humor. <laughs> Praise God my wife thinks I'm funny. Uh, I don't think I'm very humorous otherwise. Uh, judgment. And then prudence. Um, those are the ones, that, again, probably with the carton of ice cream, that's where I need a little more prudence in my life. Uh, how, how was it for you both? And what did you think of the assessment tool? So I thought it was pretty spot on when I looked at the top five. Uh, not surprised at all to see hope as my number one. Mm. Um, I tend and I know you've been leaning to hope a lot. Lately. Yes, but I'm also an eternal optimist, um, often to the chagrin of certain family members. <laughs> so, uh, But hope is something I, I cling to all the time. Mm. Everything will always work out. It will be fine. Everything is good. You know, that's my mantra. Um, but then number two is fairness, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, number three is judgment. And the first one I saw that I was like, judgment, but I'm not a judgy person. But really what judgment means is that you're willing to look at all sides and to do some evaluation and understand something before you make a decision. Discernment might be a good word. Yeah. Discernment's much better than judgment. <laughs> judgment feels very uh, judgy. Yes. Uh, but uh, <laughs> number four is perspective. And that's, of course, being able to take in lots of different perspectives. And that I'm, I do that all the time. I'm constantly looking what's on the other side of the coin. Um, and then prudence. And that's really not taking any undue risks, which um, makes my next to last uh, <laughs> item is bravery. So uh, bravery is at the bottom and uh, prudence is at the top. Not surprised there mm. at all. Um, and then also zest is at the very bottom of my list. Apparently, I need a little more excitement in my life. <laughs> Dude, that's why that's why you have me and Travis. That's uh, right. Yeah, so, we'll, we'll add some zest yeah. to your life. Well, you know, and then it, it's that whole introvert extrovert thing. I'm an introvert who needs to be yeah. adopted. So just adopt me, and I'm 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 a, I'm on. But <laughs> well, it's, it's yeah, it's, and it's interesting, Travis, because there's there's actually a lot of similarity between yours and mine. Um, and my number, so my number one is leadership, and mm. it, it's a thing that it came out that way because as soon as I started to see these. I started to ask myself as a leader, how can I use this? Yep. Which is exactly what it does. And one thing that you can do uh, that I think is helpful is you can actually look at your your bottom, right? What am I, what what do I need work at? And then that tells you the kinds of people that you need to surround yourself with. Exactly. Because they're strong in the ways that you're weak. And so if there's, I mean, if there's 10 Kevin Scott's leading the charge, I mean, God help you. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but again, I mean, what, what came out here again, I mean, leadership is number one, zest is number two, spirituality, creativity, um, and gratitude, mm. which none of, none of that really surprised me. But then you go, you go all the way to the bottom and the stuff that I need to, to work at. And really, I mean, I could probably sum all of this up in like one word. And that's that I need to look before I leave. Okay. <laughs> 110 miles an hour all of the time. And I need, and I'm, I'm a very big picture thinker and I need people around me like Trish who maybe take fewer risks and who are because prudence is in like my, it's my last one. Okay. It's, it's my last one. You because and me both it, there, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so I, I need people like a Trish Freshwater who can say to me, okay, this is a great idea, but have you thought about all the landmines that are in between A and B? Like, let's and talk about And I'll do that for you very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. You and I have worked together on this. I know that. I know that very well, and it's why I love and appreciate you. <laughs> I'll do all the research for you. It's, yeah. it's, all, it's all covered. <laughs> my wife does this for me, and uh, she, she's got a lot of prudence and judgment, which I, I need a lot of that in my Would life. Would you like to see the spreadsheet I have for my son's college applications? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes, there's lots of decision-making going on there. <laughs> Hey, so, so let me ask you, where, where do you see this as being helpful as, as we think about our listening and viewing audience and the things that they should take away from our conversation on uh, developing character, its importance, uh, the, the value of the VIA tool? What should be a takeaway for them today? I think one of the biggest things people need to remember is, uh, and it makes me think about a t-shirt we had at church, the de it's the destination that matters. Mm. And it's really not who you are today, but who you want to be. And, and don't feel stuck. If you don't feel that your character 
is where you want it to be, you have every opportunity to mold and shape and and find that closeness with God. Or, or maybe there's something else in your life you need to be working on. You can always work towards that. Character is not something set for life. Yeah, I think a great word in this is yet. You may not be this person yet. Correct. But um, through focused discipline, through trials, unfortunately, but but also the blessing of it, and through growing closer to Christ, you can grow in that Christ-likeness and, and the character that he can bring. Uh, Kevin, how about for you? What uh, should be a takeaway? Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think especially the um, the the character strengths uh, assessment tool. I mean, I th- we we lost Kevin here for a second. Um, we lost your your volume. Try it again. Kevin got muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I know it was profound what he was going to say, and um, somehow we we lost him. Uh, no, we're we're still losing you, Kevin. Um, Hey, you know what? I know what you were going to say was profound, uh, but you know what, Kevin? Uh, we will um, uh, maybe have you uh, share next time what it is. So. <laughs> anyway, hey, thank you, everybody. <laughs> this is Life on a Podcast. Uh, we want to thank our listening and viewing audience uh, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Trish. Thank you, uh, Rev Kev, uh, for being here. Um, we, we hope and pray that this has been blessing for you, and we just would like to give you a call to action. If you have been blessed by this conversation, Number one, um, if you're seeking to grow in your character, uh, reach out to us at called to be podcast at gmail.com. Love to talk to you about uh, how do you take the uh, via character assessment, uh, this survey, and um, to maybe do some coaching around it uh, to grow in your character so you can match that with your competency and make a greater kingdom impact. Uh, also, too, if you were blessed by this, uh, make sure not just to like and comment. We need that, by the way, to help with the algorithms on YouTube and other social media. So please like and comment, but also share this with somebody who you think would be blessed as well. Uh, As always, we want to thank Malam and the Southeastern District for their generous gift that made this podcast possible. And with that, God's richest blessings, and we'll catch you next time for the Call to Be podcast. Take care, everybody.